perhaps, some royal palaces. Where, then, in this mix of text and ruin is Memphis, the legendary. City of the White Walls celebrated by classical histories, and long since. Regarded by traditional historians as the capital city of ancient Egypt, obviously, there was no place in Pharaoh's Egypt for a city in the modern sense of that word, such cities, just as Aristophanes' character. Ramones were dependent on their survival for monetary exchanges in the marketplace. To that extent, at least, there were no urban populations in Pharaoh's Egypt, nothing beyond the pyramid builders. Settlements and the network of institutions up and down the river involved in their supply. Old Kingdom Memphis, therefore, was composed of various gatherings of courtly settlements, of warehouses, studios and shipyards that shifted over the 20-mile region on the west bank of the river in concert with the various locations chosen for the Pyramid of the Living King. The Memphis of today, the ruins visited by tourists, was a product of later ages. Early Memphis was not a city, but a region nor would the temporary nature of these settlements have presented many problems to the communities of pyramid builders. Mud bricks are swiftly made from mile silt, and field stone is easily obtained from the little deserts and the cliffs beyond the river's silt plains. So courtly settlements were quickly made. From its beginnings, pharaonic rule had been a peripatetic phenomenon, the royal household sailing in flotilla through the landscapes of the Lower Nile establishing temporary courts of residence. In similar fashion, the settlements at Giza appear to have been rapidly constructed, easily adapted and enlarged, and swiftly denuded of their wood and cut stone when the pyramid builders moved onto other sites. Seen in this light, the pyramids, those great stone tents, pitched high on the horizon, were the antithesis of the living state. Constancy and change. The first signs of the profound changes that occurred within the order of the state following the abandonment of building colossal pyramids can be dated to around 2500 BC and are found at the Pyramid of the Pharaoh. Yuzerkov, who succeeded Shepses, the king who had abandoned the traditional form of the royal tomb in favor of a massive mastaba of stone, as if to emphasize the return to orthodoxy. Yuzerkov's pyramid was sited at the center of the old Saqqara cemeteries, close to the enclosure. Wall of Djoser's Step Pyramid, the first built pyramid of them all. A dangerous and shapeless ruin, Yuzerkov's half-excavated funerary complex had once consisted of a rectangular wall that had enclosed both the royal pyramid and a compact and innovatory gathering of temples and subsidiary, so-called queens, pyramids. Built at around a third of the size of the colossal pyramids, this royal pyramid signaled the dramatic change of scale and royal building that, with some slight variations, was adopted by all the later Memphis pharaohs. The change was both dramatic and historic. When the baselines of Yuzerkov's pyramid were laid out, the construction of the four colossal pyramids had been completed just 30 years before. Yet the extensive supply systems which were built up in that heroic century had already been diminished. The best part of the fleets of boats and barges, the huge regiments of copper miners and quarrymen, the armies of stone haulers, the settlements of the largest labor force the world had ever known, were no longer in operation. The court's utter concentration on royal pyramid construction had run its course and as its architectural emphasis had changed so did the nature of the court itself. By the time of Yuzerkov's successors, when the pyramid builders of Abusir were making pyramids of similar size to Thauf Yuzerkov's, the change within the court is apparent both in the enlarging number and diversity of courtiers' tombs and in the ever-lengthening list of names and titles which are recorded in them. And that in turn suggests that the pharaonic administration was supporting more households than before and thus ever increasing numbers of the courtly dead, whose cults, as the surviving records demonstrate, were served by growing numbers of priestly households who operated much the same rota systems as those employed within the royal temples. In these same times, priests not only appear to have increased in
number but also, as their tomb chapel's inscriptions suggest, their roles. Within the court were more precisely defined. The loose translation. Priest, indeed, covers a group of courtly titles which include and more. Literal translations the terms God's servant, peer one, God's father and even, simply, old one, as distinct offices held by different people within the court hierarchy, these different terms started to be differentiated in the times of the Abbasir kings, previously, they had been sprinkled amongst many vague and varied epithets recorded in the tomb chapels, having diverted a great part of its activities away from the act of building colossal pyramids, the resources of the state had turned towards elaborating and monumentalizing in stone architecture the offices of the largely anonymous and undocumented government machine that it had inherited from the Giza kings. To this extent, the sun temples of Abusir, those innovatory and somewhat temporary structures, marked the beginning of a process by which the vast systems of supply and offering that had built the four great pyramids were formalized and elaborated, and as the complexity of the royal administration enlarged, so had the numbers of state officials outside the circle of the royal household, though the households of these new officials may also have been subsidized from private estates, this seemingly rapid increase in the size of the formal administration and in the offering cults of its dead officials could easily have been accommodated by the surplus state resources which had resulted from the abandonment of building colossal pyramids. These swift changes in the distribution of state resources may also account for the sudden appearance of the sun temples at Abusir, those major, novel distribution conduits, the first of which was built in the reign of Userkov, that the two excavated sun temples show evidence of. Considerable and continuous enlargement throughout their working lives may further reflect these changing patterns in the distribution of state resources. Within this changing state, court life was ordered in cycles of right and celebration. In the times of the Abusir kings, so the remaining offering facilities in the surviving archives both suggest the daily rituals of the court were still derived from those celebrated in the times of the archaic kings, when monarchs had been ceremonially dressed for the rites of presentation and offering that had been celebrated in royal courts. Throughout the region of the Lower Nile, at Abusir, the living kings were represented by statues that were variously enshrined within the pyramid, temples in the sun temples, whilst at the royal palace, so text of the following century inform us, a similar round of daily ritual, time to coincide with the passage of the sun, revolved round the person of the living king himself. And all those daily rites were punctuated by the regular celebration of festivals accompanying events within the farming and calendric years, and others that are traditionally termed jubilees, marked special years in the reigns of individual pharaohs. Sections of the Abusir papyri list wrote as in which the same named Personnel are described as moving between the royal temples, the sun. Temples in the royal residences, where, presumably, they performed. The same ritual duties, which suggests that the daily rites undertaken in. Those three courtly settings were fundamentally one and the same. That. Those same papyri name individuals who are described as working at the. Sun temples yet who are also known from inscriptions in their tomb. Chapels to have been close to the living king and to have held offices in. The administration shows that this rota of ritual and offering was integrated with what the modern world would term the secular arm of government. Some of these people, so their titles tell, were members of groups that were denominated in hieroglyphic as Zaw and which today are more usually described as files, an ancient Greek term for a clan or a quasitribal group. Once more, the origins of these groups appear to lie in the days of the first kings, when some of the names of those same files were inscribed on the pots and vases of the first royal funerary cults. Deriving from compass points and parts of boats, several of these files names also appear in the graffiti of the work gangs who were engaged in building the colossal pyramids. And at Abusir as well, one of the temple follies appears to have been involved in quarrying and hauling stone for 
the Royal Pyramid. Though evidence is slight, it would appear that these files were a broad-based system of allegiances whose memberships could include both courtiers and workmen from the same household or even, perhaps, people who had shared a common place of birth. At all events, within the offering cults of the kings of Abusir these traditional groupings had operated a ten-month system of rotation, a system that is reflected in the architecture of both the pyramids and the sun temples of Abusir, where, as their archaeologists discovered, each file had its own designated storeroom, modeling the universe. Just as the files had a long-established place within the order of the living state and set locations in the architecture of its temples, so, too, from their papyrus-shaped columns to the stars painted on their ceilings. The temples were designed in the image and the order of the kingdom. The very limestone of their walls had been quarried from the Nile cliffs, whilst the glistening hard stones of the temple's pavements, columns and stories in the copper of the mason's chisels had been shipped from the far ends of the kingdom and if the meat on the sun temple's altars had come mostly from the delta, then the river's valley had supplied the better part of the grain, from which the copious offerings of bread and beer were made. These continuous acts of gathering and ordering of the physical substance of the kingdom in the form of the temple's architecture and rites of offerings was further reflected in the division of the temple staff into northern and southern sections, which, like the order of the files, reflected their roles both in terms of the daily ritual and, as the tomb. Chapels inscriptions also show, in the governance of the kingdoms, regions, just as the temple's reliefs laid out the order and activity of the court, so the fundamental elements and order of its kingdom were reflected in the temple's architecture. This it would appear is the underlying reason why, although the royal palaces and settlements were Made of friable mud brick, its courtly tombs and temples were fashioned from enduring stone, the form and order of the state required endurance. In the beginning, the cemeteries of the prehistoric settlements of the Lower Nile had been set close to the mud houses of the living, and the dead had been buried with the finest goods their culture could provide, and offerings of food were left beside the grave. It was a simple system, in which the living and the dead participated in maintaining the Settlement's identity and order, and that same system would underlie the order of the later state, just as the early farmers had visited the graveyards beside their settlements and slaughtered animals and feasted. Amongst the graves, so phalanxes of pharaohs, priests, and slaughterers, and various officials cooked foods, brewed beer, and presented daily offerings to the dead kings in the great temples that had been built beside the royal tombs for that especial purpose. Just as today a person might declare that, without faith, life would have no form or purpose, so, without the continuing operation of those obligations and activities, without the daily work of tomb and temple building and of provisioning, the ancestors, the gods and the living communities of the court, the ancient culture would have dissolved, manifested in its networks of tithing, collection and supply, the Efficacy of this unique culture was reaffirmed at the beginning of every reign when the state machine began to build another pyramid. So the architecture of the pyramid complexes manifest the living systems of that state and good hard stone, and the structures of tithing and supply, which had enabled their construction continued to be acted out in dramatic continuation after Pharaoh's death and rites of offering. Like the inhabitants of the early farming settlements, at Abusir, the state system operated within the archaic theaters of life and death. These are the fundamental principles that explain all of the surviving manifestations of the pharaonic kingdom of the Lower Nile. It was not a complex system, though to modern minds it's splendidly sophisticated. And often enigmatic relics might first suggest the operation of a near-modern state with an elaborate theology. In reality they are a millennial. Duplication, elegant, consistent and concise, of a single set of rites, the rites of presentation and of offering, on which the state was founded. 14. The Living Kingdom. Copper and the Kings. After Giza, 
The huge reduction in the quality and size of Royal Pyramid. Construction had transformed pharaonic culture. One practical example of this great change was a product of the increased availability of copper, the raw material that in the form of saws and chisels had shaped the four great pyramids and the timbers of the enormous barges that shipped much of their stone. Before the construction of the four great pyramids, the craftsmen's studios in the building works of even the longest reigns had required, at most, some 70 tons of the red metal. Just the first year of working on the Great Pyramid, however, had consumed a similar amount and that monument had taken some 14 years to build. All and all, during the century in which the four colossal pyramids were built, some 950 tons of the metal would have been mined, smelted and sent to Memphis to make the tools used by the masons and the shipwrights of the court. Such extraordinary levels of production represented a tenfold increase in the size of personnel, provisions and supplies required, the food and water, tools and fuel, to support the copper miners in such hostile deserts as those of the peninsula of Sinai. These sudden, burgeoning needs impelled, in turn, a considerable upgrading of the kingdom's transport networks. In the case of copper, as Recent archaeology and some recently discovered papyri have shown. This prompted the establishment of new routes to the Sinai copper mines. These crossed Egypt's eastern deserts to give access to newly made ports. On the Red Sea coast and the sea lanes which ran up the stormy northern reaches of that narrow waterway to harbors and transit stations close to. The Sinai copper mines. Pyramids of the size of Userkofs and those of later kings, alternatively required but a thirtieth of the materials needed for the construction of those four great pyramids. So even if the best part of the pharaonic mining camps and shipyards established in earlier times had been speedily closed down within a state machine that was not driven by money but on a continuity of activity and a regularity of supply there would have been a considerable build-up of such materials as copper, plaster, timber and hard desert stone. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that as well as the royal architecture containing considerable quantities of beautiful granites, quartzites, and basalts, the first temple to be built at Abusir had a remarkable solid copper drain pipe some 330 yards long, running down through the desert to the cultivated land and, as Burchard would report, huge wooden doors secured with massive bolts and chains and catches, all beautifully and ingeniously wrought from large quantities of copper. At the same time, there was also a greatly increased use of copper. Outside the orbit of the court, when the colossal pyramids had been under construction, the use of such materials had been largely confined to the pyramids and their adjacent cemeteries, and there were few monuments of cut stone outside the region of Memphis. After the age of the four great pyramids, however, increasing numbers of tomb chapels were quarried, finished and engraved throughout the valley of the lower Nile, every element of which, their architecture, inscriptions and relief, was cut with copper tools. The growing numbers of these monuments, therefore, witnessed the slow diffusion of that courtly metal, along with the culture of the Memphite court, throughout the valley of the lower Nile. Neki and Cage at Tina. The first known example of the use of copper tools on a large scale. Outside the region of Memphis is a large rock cut tomb that was made a generation before the reign of Userkov, in the time of Menkore, when one Neki Ank, a steward of the royal residence, governor of new settlements, set his monument high in the Nile side cliffs 100 miles to the south of Saqqara and close today to the village of Tina, in the region that is now called Middle Egypt. Neki Hank's tomb was the first of a line of similar monuments to be cut into that dramatic cliff for succeeding generations of his household, though badly damaged now. Sufficient of their inscriptions survived to show that Neki Hank had bequeathed to his successors parcels of land that had been granted to him by the king, as recorded in one of his tomb chapel inscriptions which was also duplicated in the adjacent tomb of his successor, his
namesake and, probably, his eldest son. Similar texts of the same period describe other examples of what appear to have been royal gifts of land, but most of them are very damaged. A few rare, rather ambiguous inscriptions in earlier Memphis. Tomb chapels suggest that royal grants of land had also been awarded to courtiers for their development as farms, unlike Neki Ank's land grant. However, those of the earlier colonizers seem not to have been hereditary and appear to have undergone further exchanges in stewardship. At all events, it is hardly likely that any of those royal grants had awarded courtiers ownership of land in the modern sense of that word. Ultimately, the names of the old kingdom pharaohs commanded the floodplain, the quarries and mines in the surrounding deserts and the organization of the various labor forces that made the products of that courtly culture. A host of tomb chapel inscriptions, for example, describe how the kings of Abusir and their successors provided their courtiers with fine stone for their tomb chapels and desert stone for their sarcophagi and even on occasion, supplied the court's workshops with exotic woods and other materials for the manufacture of their courtiers. Burial equipment. It would appear, therefore, that the lands of the lower Nile were at the disposal of Pharaoh, who, through the offices of the royal court, encouraged their further development for both cattle raising and for cultivation. Several inscriptions from the times of the Abusir kings Record Pharaoh's personal interest in schemes of canal making and water. Conservation, whilst texts in several provincial tomb chapels describe the founding and controlling of new settlements and large tracts of land. The role of the offices of the king in such enterprises is further underlined by the incorporation of the royal name within many of these so-called new settlements, whilst the fact that, in reality, some of those lands had long since held communities bearing other names, simply endorses pharaohs. Continuing drive for renewal and increased agricultural production, based on the assumption that ancient states were similar to modern ones, traditional historians usually describe the relocation of the households of some of the Memphite courtiers into the provinces as the beginning of a catastrophic dissipation of centralized pharaonic power. That led, eventually, to the ending of the Old Kingdom. What the surviving monuments show, however, is another aspect of the changes that occurred when the court, having diverted a great part of its resources away from the single-minded act of building colossal pyramids, had turned its attentions to consolidating and perpetuating the systems of supply that it had previously created and extended, and that, in turn, prompted the physical extension of the culture of the Abusir courts, its monuments and rituals, throughout the region of the Lower Nile, visiting the tombs. For the majority of Westerners, the grand tour of Egypt had started in the 1870s when Thomas Cook and Sons obtained a concession from the Khediva Ismail to run Nile steamboats and Dahabiyas, luxurious sailing boats, from Cairo up to Aswan and into northern Nubia. Isolated. On the quiet wide river, Cook's tourists were afforded intimate views. Into the very heart of rural Upper Egypt. And as the boats moved gently. On the stream, these privileged travelers could also spot the doors of. Ancient rock-cut tomb chapels, lines of shadowed rectangles standing. Over screes of bright white limestone chips set high up in the gilded cliffs. That framed the riverside's fields. For Cook's tourists, the cliff-cut tombs promised exciting and bumpy. Rides on carriages and donkeys along the muddy edges of the fields and out onto the little hot deserts that lay beneath the limestone cliffs, before scrambling up pathways in the loose green entering the cool gloom of tomb chapels whose stained and broken walls were covered in scenes, showing agricultural activities similar to those they had observed in life from the promenades of their floating hotels. For archaeologists, those same tomb chapels indicated that there had been a substantial ancient settlement in the area, one with craftsmen and copper enough to support the making of such courtly monuments and to equip the ancient burials, which might still lay undisturbed beneath the tomb chapels, at the bottom of rock-cut shafts. 
more than a thousand decorated tomb chapels are known to have survived from the age of the Old Kingdom, of which some six hundred are still standing. Almost a third of that number are provincial tombs in order, excavated in the limestone of the Nile side cliffs. Even as the craftsmen of the court were decorating the temples of Abu Sir with elegant scenes of country life, some contemporary courtiers were casting their eyes over rural landscapes that their forefathers had long since abandoned for Memphis and a life at court. Hardly any funerary monuments had been made outside of the central Memphis cemeteries in the times of Khufu and Khafra, and most of those had been set close to the archaic royal burying grounds at Abidison, Upper Egypt. In the times of the Abusir kings, however, at least ten large rock-cut tombs are known to have been excavated in the Niles Valley, south of Memphis, whilst in the following 150 years, over a hundred more such monuments were made. Most of these rock-cut tombs are clustered in twenty-odd sites between Memphis and Aswan and Ar. Known today by the musical Arabic names of nearby towns and villages. Dasasha, Hagarza, Naga el Deer, Ka el Kabir, Sidmen, Meir, Edfu, Dirgea, and the like. In their own day, it must have seemed as if a courtly colonization of the Lower Nile was underway. For in those times, large tracts of land both in the river's valley and its delta were uncultivated. These provincial monuments are different from those of their Memphite predecessors. In the delta, where the evidence is comparatively thin, massive tombs were still made in the traditional way, and blocks of limestone were sometimes shipped from quarries in the river's valley to aid in their construction. Most of the provincial tombs within the Nile Valley, however, did not continue that archaic tradition and were excavated in the cliffs along the valley's edge, a method that appears to have been invented in the cemeteries of Giza, where the ranks of the older, earlier stone block mass sabbaths had been set, so close together that there was little room for the facilities of offering or to make space for the burials of later generations of the courtly households. An early and influential solution to the growing shortage of space within the Giza cemeteries had been to excavate the bedrock underneath one of the great stone mass sabbaths of Khufu's queens, and then to fashion an entrance door that led to two rock-cut rooms beyond, one holding an offering chapel, the other a burial shaft. In the following decades, this simple scheme was extended so that other doorways resembling that of a massive offering chapel were cut into the walls of the nearby stone quarries, and the same two-room plan was excavated in the rock beyond. These are the first known rock-cut tombs in Egypt, and their design was adopted by the provincial courtiers so that the lines of their dories dash. Rectangles of shadow marked with white screes of chippings beneath. Them from the tomb's excavation came to punctuate whole sections of that narrow landscape. At first, those provincial tombs consisted of the two-room scheme of the Giza tombs, the first room, an offering chapel. With decorations similar to those in the earlier Massaba tombs, the second room holding a deep shaft with a sarcophagus at its bottom. Ever inventive, however, the craftsmen swiftly rang a peal of variations on. Those basic units in the later provincial rock tombs took on many different forms. All along the valley, set high up in the cliffs and far removed from human settlement, most of the provincial rock-cut tomb chapels of the Old Kingdom had been of little practical use to the later farmers of the Nile Valley, and so until quite recently most of them lay open and abandoned, stained by wasp, nests and bat droppings, their wall scenes were difficult to see, many of their ceilings had collapsed in ancient earthquakes, half burying the chambers decorations, and most of the darkest chambers held. Dangerously deep burial chamber shafts cut straight into their floors. Yet, more discouraging was the fact that the tomb chapel surviving decorations were often scarred by the chiselings of antiquities. Merchants, who would remove odd chunks of museum-worthy decoration, by cutting a rectangular frame deep into the wall around the section that they wanted to remove, then slicing off the isolated portion of relief with 
Frayed wire cable, which cuts the soft white limestone with horrifying efficiency. Many of these tomb chapels are now beautifully restored and are well-known fixtures on the tourist trail, some of the more desolate and isolated examples, however, have yet to be examined, and doubtless, there are many more, whole cemeteries perhaps, still buried in the screes of debris that lie along the valley's cliffs. These provincial tomb chapels represent a new strand in the pharaonic courtly culture that quickly developed a vigorous character of its own. At the beginning, there is firm evidence of individual memphi. Craftsmen working up and down the Nile Valley, for some of the scenes. Within the provincial tomb chapels were derived from the reliefs within the temples of the kings. Others, however, were copied from the reliefs. In the tomb chapels of Memphis, where there were two different schools of craftsmanship and design working side by side. In the times of the Abusir kings the bulk of the contemporary courtiers had built their funerary monuments of stone blocks set in the form of archaic mass abbas and built either in the traditional burying grounds of the Giza Plateau, beside the three great pyramids, or in the desert, burying grounds of Saqqara, where they were dominated by the ancient pyramid enclosure of King Djoser, which in those days appears to have housed the administrative offices of those ancient cemeteries, following the clearance of their protecting sand drifts in the last decades of the 19th century. Many of the Saqqara tomb chapels have been eroded by the raw desert winds. Others have simply disappeared, having been taken away, block by block, by antiquities. Merchants who were following in the footsteps of the early archaeologists and supplying the museums of Europe and America with whole walls and sometimes entire tomb chapels covered in fine relief. What survives, however, the vividly decorated so-called tomb of the Two brothers, for example, along with such famous monuments as the Mastabas of Tahotep, Dean Maruka, shows that a highly inventive school of craftsmen was working at Saqqara in the latter half of the Old Kingdom, craftsmen who were greatly elaborating and extending earlier tomb chapel decoration and even, on occasion, employing painting rather than engraving, which gives their scenes a livelier and freer air. At Giza, on the other hand, there was a separate school of craftsmen, working in a manner more in keeping with the great grand monuments, on that high plateau, which had retained a style of tomb chapel, decoration that is more formal, more reserved, than the sprightlier. Saqqara scenes. Both of those two Memphite schools can be detected in the provincial cemeteries along the valley of the lower Nile. The tomb chapels at Taina, for example, bear direct relationship to earlier work within the Giza cemeteries, whilst the scenes from several Saqqara tombs were directly copied onto the walls of a variety of rock-cut tomb chapels in other sites in Middle Egypt. Here, one might imagine, the craftsmen had used a medium such as a sheet of linen or papyrus on which to copy the Memphite originals and had then transported their copies to the provincial tomb chapels, where they had been redrawn and recarved. At that same time there was a lively traffic in statues made in the Memphite workshops, excavations at sites all over Upper Egypt yielding works of high court style as well as many local imitations. Along with the occasional idiosyncrasy of style or draftsmanship, the high quality of some of the reliefs in these provincial rock-cut tombs suggest that they were engraved by traveling craftsmen from the Saqqara cemeteries. Other later tombs, alternatively, show very different hands at work, provincial craftsmen working in several different cemeteries busily engaged in translating some of those traditional menfeet scenes in fresh and vivid ways. Some of these tomb chapels show an uncommon delight in strong patterning and provide highly original observations of provincial life which, over time, through rain. After rain, served to transform the relatively staid composure of the older decorations into vigorous, if somewhat folksy, renderings of the same iconic scenes but drawn now with an eye for local detail and rye. Caricature, a quail watches a reaper at his work, a monkey imitates the gestures of a dancer, 
Dog sitting beneath their master's chair scoff a good fat goose, a traditional explanation of such scenes in their accompanying texts. In all these tomb chapels is that they are the product of a simple-minded concern with the preservation of the tomb owner's spirit, that such scenes were a magical means of supplying him with a perpetual source of stony foodstuffs. What they ultimately describe, however, in this holds true for both the Memphis and provincial tomb chapels, is the role of the tomb chapel's proprietor within the structures of the state. Typically, at Giza, at Saqqara and the provinces, images of the tomb. Chapel's owner were placed on either side of its entrance doorway, accompanied by texts listing the courtier's epithets and titles, sometimes seated, but more usually standing. Further images of him will appear throughout his monument, like the figures of the kings within their temples. The tomb owners are shown beside offering tables and on full-size reproductions of a wooden house door, the so-called false doors, that were carved in relief so that the noble dead may pass each day into the living world. These false doors are the targets towards which, line on line, figure after figure, the decorations in these chapels guide. The eye, and offerings were laid on low altars set at their foot. The tomb owner's figures, always the principal subjects of these graphic compositions, are shown viewing the activities portrayed in the manner of a supervisor. Line on line, the figures, the tomb owner, his wife and children, his household officers and servants, are ranked in size, the largest being the monument's proprietor, his accompanying. Household and family are drawn at smaller sizes, while smaller still are. The estate personnel, who are shown in various workshops, on the river, and in the fields and granaries, though more complex in their detail and their composition than earlier examples of such scenes, the subject. Matter hardly ever changes nor, even, the poses of the participants. Hunting in the marshes in the desert, servants making and preparing. The goods and provisions that define courtly life and, finally, workers. Undertaking a variety of activities which supported that way of life. Building boats, cultivating fields, herding livestock and making pots. Statues, vases and jewelry. Throughout it all a rigorous hierarchy is. Observed. And neither kings nor gods are ever shown within the private. Tomb chapels, nor, of course, are scenes of royal ritual. In the nobles, tomb chapels, the courtiers themselves are shown in the manner of the kings, as lords of everything in their domain. Dot scenes from life, a common scene in the provincial tomb chapels, and one appropriate to their time and place, shows cows and bulls of different colors, plain and spotted, black and white, bulls and herds, bulls fighting, cows giving birth, cattle at the plow, and cattle being expertly butchered by their slaughterers. It would appear, therefore, that as well as the long-established delta farms that were breeding and fattening bulls for the Abusir temples, some of the estates of the provincial courtiers within the Niles Valley were also supplying those protein-rich cargoes to the courts of Abusir and Saqqara, and the texts alongside many of those images show that the tomb chapel owners had been proud to cultivate those splendid beasts. Such enormous animals were not usually a part of a subsistence. Farmers' holdings, yet their preeminence as offerings and as a preferred food of the living court had given them an important role in its agricultural undertaking since the state's beginning. The annals of the early kings, indeed, list the numbers of cattle counts that had taken place in individual reigns and frequently employ those numbered cattle counts rather than a monarch's years of rule, to mark the lengths of individual reigns. So those painted cows upon the wall of the provincial tomb chapels are evidence of the continuing role of the tomb chapel's owners within the culture of the court, that some of those cattle-breeding nobles had established households and provinces far from Memphis underlines the fact that by the times of the Abusir kings even the most far-flung Courtiers were provisioning the royal court, the great wide river, the essential artery of that traffic in the medium by which, for centuries past, vast tonnages of provisions, men, 
and building stone had moved with ease throughout the kingdom, bound. All the settlements along the lower Nile, large and small alike, directly to Memphis and the offices of state, and travel on that most beauteous of. Metros was swift and easy, Senegemib into sarcophagus, so his son. Records in his tomb chapel texts had been barged to Memphis from quarries at the southernmost point of the kingdom in less than a week. Other courtiers, moreover, had held estates throughout the kingdom and sent their children off to Memphis for education at the royal residence. In short, the river's statewide span, its steady flow and countervailing winds, had enabled him to find that most fortunate of kingdoms from its beginnings. There was, therefore, no need, no place, for towns or cities in this realm, nothing larger than the settlements of Pharaoh close by the pyramids. As Donald Redford puts it, the metropolitan states of Western Asia and the Mediterranean, with an elite separated from the agricultural basis of their existence by many social strata, does not find a parallel on the banks of the Nile River. Most earlier Egyptologists, however, had assumed that such celebrated sites as Aswan, Edfu, and Hierakompolis, Memphis, Udo and Bubastis had once been ancient cities. Yet Memphis of the White Walls dashed the Memphis of the Greek and Roman travelers and of 19th century. Imagination was sustained by markets and a monetary economy, and the Old Kingdom had been very far removed from such classical or modern concepts of urban life. The fundamental nature of that most ancient state was agricultural. The gulf between Memphis and its provinces was not nearly as great as one might at first imagine. Even the royal residence was set beside canals and at the edge of farmland. And certainly, the lifestyle of the court as it is depicted in its courtiers. Myriad tomb chapels is always shown as country life and never as taking place within the confines of some kind of city. Like the majority of inhabitants of this planet before quite recent times, Pharaoh's people had lived rural lives. In the delta where the broad sill plains stretched to the horizon, the settlements and farms were spaced amongst the river's ever-changing branches. In the narrow valley, from Memphis to Aswan, the farms and settlements, which in old kingdom times are usually estimated to have numbered fewer than 2,000, were set within the silty ribbons that lay on each side of the great wide river. Almost nothing is known about the realities of those farming settlements within the Nile Valley. Beyond a few excavations of some unusual communities, a carefully planned complex beside the Giza plateau built to house the pyramid makers, an island settlement at Aswan provisioned by the government, some desert mansions and a few odd houses set on ancient mounds, nothing else is known. In a similarly disappointing fashion, although archaeologists have indeed uncovered Old Kingdom farming settlements within the Nile Delta, most of their plans conform to the typical patterns of state. Planning, large orthogonally planned complexes somewhat similar to the settlements beside the Giza pyramids, rather than indigenous farms or Villages, these appear to have been purpose-built state colonies and are probably the ruins of estates like those that are named in the offering. Processions within the tombs and temples, and thus are hardly typical of life down on the farm. In prehistoric times, the people of the region of the Lower Nile had lived in settlements that at most comprised the dwellings of a few hundred people and were built on the river Sil Plain, amidst the fields that they cultivated. Within the river valley, the most densely populated regions were where the sill plains were at their narrowest in irrigation, easily controlled, that is, in the region between Aswan and Abidus in the south and in the final hundred miles of the river's progress before the Memphite region, where the silt slowly starts to widen into the delta, as the season cooled and the time of the annual flood drew near, those Farmers had retreated with their grain stocks and their animals to higher ground. In the Nile Delta these elevated refuges were the so-called turtle backs or levees that had been thrown up by sandstorms in the river's sluggish flow. In the valley, they were mostly situated at the 
Edges of the little deserts that lay beyond the sill plain in the valleys. Fringing cliffs. Modern analysis of farming settlements along the valley of the Nile. Those millennia shows that those early farmers had moved ever closer to the marshes on the river's banks, a trend that may well have continued. In the times of the Memphite pharaohs, when large sections of the lower now were still not under cultivation, and this is an especial disadvantage. For archaeologists, for the course of the Nile has moved back and forth across its black sill plain over the last few thousand years virtually, obliterating all evidence of ancient life within that area not made of stone. At all events, not a single old kingdom farm or hamlet has yet been excavated within the Nile Valley. That lost life, however, is reflected in scenes within the courtiers. Tomb chapels and is implied in the farming implements, their wooden handles still shiny from use, that have been found in some contemporary tombs. Both those sources show that the techniques of farming had hardly changed until relatively recently, that though the sill plain of the River Valley had been entirely colonized in the following millennia. The beautiful environment that the early farmers had started to create would remain virtually unchanged until modern times. Napoleon's cartographers, indeed, had mapped it during their invasion of Egypt. Not surprisingly, the surviving tools and utensils of the Old Kingdom show that the vast ongoing movements of people and supplies, which the pyramid building kings had accelerated, had also consolidated the processes of statewide standardization. So when the potter's kick wheel, a device that offered both an increased speed of production and a saving of worked raw clay, was introduced in the times of the Abusir kings. It had been quickly taken up throughout the kingdom, from the weights and measures used to quantify the harvest to the style and shapes of workaday objects used in carpentry and weaving, in brewing and Baking, cloth-making and pottery, there was a statewide conformity of culture beyond that of most other ancient societies. Many of the forms and techniques of this ancient way of life, indeed, had hardly changed. Until quite recently, some of the loaves of bread that have been found in ancient tombs, for example, are similar in size and manufactured to some of those made in upper Egyptian villages to this day. We, too. The single staple crop that provided bread and beer throughout the land was largely standardized. Unlike today, however, the eyes and taste buds of the ancient scribes made a firm distinction between the grain of the river's valley and its delta. Both in the valley and the delta households, however, bread and beer were made side by side and, as brewing and baking both required ceramic jars and molds. A potter's studio and kiln were generally to be found close to the grinding stones, the kilns and ovens, captioned and labeled, images of all those essential activities of daily life are shown side by side in many a courtier's tomb chapel, alongside other images of daily life in courtly households. Many of these scenes are accompanied by short exclamatory texts as lively as the images beside them. So workers tying down a cow for slaughter might tell their partners to pull hard, my friend. Dash in. Exhortation that is often followed by an ominous do it, make it happen. Hurry. Dash in reapers gathering stucks of wheat destined for the household's threshing floors tell their comrades look, the donkey's airy coming, tie the sack, steady the pannier, whilst the herdsman in a Tiny boat transporting cows and calves across a crocodile-infested stream. Urges his companion to row, comrade. Go slowly, and a sailor on a. Now boat exclaims pay attention to the ropes. Or turn to starboard. Right away, so that we may fare well. Down by the riverside, the Nile silt descended into lush marshlands. With rippling sands of sedge, reed and papyrus. Quiet, closed areas of. Considerable beauty, these water meads were inhabited by a variety of small mammals, by frogs and water snakes, by the occasional crocodile, and hippopotamus and, in their proper seasons, by huge flocks of migrating birds, from pelicans to pintails, thirsty for the riverine oasis, and hungry for the food that it sustained. Here fishermen cast their nets, 
as their boat slid slowly between the reeded islands that shifted shape, and rose and fell according to the height and season of the flood. And, here as well, amongst those closed and narrow waterways, huntsmen, and courtiers alike caught fish and waterfowl, the latter being taken, with the aid of an ingenious array of decoys and throw sticks, traps and clap nets, and all this is shown with great delight within the courtiers. Tomb chapels. Flat and incredibly fertile, the farm sections of two alluvial plains that lay behind the marshes were divided, in the usual way of handworked farms, into small-sized strips, traversed by narrow, dusty and slightly elevated pathways tufted with supporting grasses, these little fields were watered from small channels which ran alongside the pathways and carried carefully measured parcels of the river water, which had been trapped and conserved in wide and shallow water basins. When the annual flood waters had retreated, the farmers were expert at maintaining water levels in their fields, and there was virtually no rain. No crops grew anywhere within the regions of the lower Nile unless they were constantly watered by human hands or unless their roots reached down into the underlying water table, but the crops grew large and luscious under the deep blue sky and were beautifully celebrated in the tombs and temples and images of bounteous offerings. Stands of trees stood beside the little pathways that ran alongside the irrigation channels, apart from high curving date palms. These were mostly low and straggling tamarisks and acacias, native shallow-rooted hardwood trees with gnarled and twisted branches whose hard brown wood was used in boat building and in mud brick architecture. Cultivated in copses, such trees also provided the farmers with firewood. And as rain hardly ever fell, a fine film of silt and sand lay thick upon their leaves, giving them a celadon dry glaze that turned their vivid foliage into the vaguest shades of green their small bright flowers, shining like stars against the copses' shadowed interiors. Tamarisks and acacias thrive in all but the most arid deserts, yet they easily survive the Nile's annual flood, and as their small leaves are often encrusted with salt they also provided, along with several species of tough low bushes, tasty pasturage for sheep and goats, who managed to avoid the considerable spikes that were hidden in their vegetation. All Vegetation growing in the narrow valley was well used and much appreciated. Court jewelers mimicked their small bright flowers in shining desert stones of red and yellow and copied the colors and forms of the fruits and flowers, the grapes, the pomegranates, carob pods, sycamore figs and jasmine that the farmers cultivated in walled orchards and vegetable gardens. Rare surviving images show that traditional farmhouses were usually Two-storied mud brick buildings surrounded by high mud brick walls and shaded by courtyard trees. Inside the enclosure walls, as well as the living quarters, which were usually composed of a series of straggling rooms built and enlarged according to the household's needs, there might be cattle pens and pig styes, fowl coops and threshing floors, grain stores, fine arbors and gardens, all of those rural paradises gifts of the Sweet waters of the river and the antithesis of the dazzling desert. Vastness of the pyramids and their attending temples. Wheat, alternatively, was cultivated in the narrow open fields, within. The simple archaic systems of low dikes designed to trap the receding. Waters of the annual flood on the flat silt fields. Both these low dikes. And the channels that ran away from them were parts of a fundamental. Irrigation system that necessitated group labor and flexible notions of land ownership. Just such a system, indeed, was still in operation in the Nile Valley in Champollion's day when, under the control of local potentates and village worthies, entire communities saw to the upkeep of the dikes, the irrigation channels and the digging and the cleaning of canals. This, then, had been an ancient state like no other. A kingdom of lush, riverine landscapes, an intimate environment in which agriculture and human habitation, courtier and peasant, live close together. And, though the greater part of this population has left no trace whatever on this earth, rare and poignant papyri from a settlement at Gebelinen, 
Upper Egypt provide a partial list of the names and occupations of a handful of the members of the provincial population in the times of the Abusir kings, bakers and brewers, potters, metal workers and herdsmen, and some farm workers who are named as king's people, a title that a tomb text describes as one held by a group of people who were working. Lands that had been granted to a courtier by the king, along with both builders and sailors and, inevitably, the scribes and clerks who counted and tied the harvests, such occupations made up the bulk of ancient Egypt's population, men and women who, the same papyri show, were liable for enlistment by the officials of the court for works of state. Scenes such as those shown inside the nobles' tomb chapels would be repeated with an extraordinary fidelity over the following millennia in the tomb chapels of later generations. Like modern wedding photographs, the aim of those tomb chapel designers was to present harmony and continuity working within society, the operation of a social compact that some of the texts of later ages would extol as a pillar of society. In similar fashion, the assertion in the texts of some of those later tomb chapels which proudly announced that their owners had provided for the welfare of local populations in time of hardship, is a declaration that stems from an awareness of the benefits of promoting a benevolent and prospering society, just as is shown in operation, time, and again, within the tomb chapels of the old kingdom courtiers. 15. Cult and Kingdom Of Courtly Cults at the same time that many courtiers were establishing households. Outside Memphis, so two temples dedicated to the royal cult were being established in the provinces. This, of itself, was not a new phenomenon. In the times of Sneferu, so, the Palermo stone records, six statues of the king had been made for variously located shrines, whilst the line of little pyramids that had been erected all along the lower valley of the Nile during that same reign had simple accommodation for the cult of royal offering, at least one of those provincial monuments having a royal statue and an offering table set beside it, whilst another had stood next to a scribal office whose officials dealt in state supply. Such modest arrangements would suggest that, in the times of the colossal pyramids, those provincial cults had served as foci and Collection points for the supply of provisions and materials destined for the pyramid makers in the living court at Memphis, just as some of the rare surviving reliefs of those same times show that large numbers of provincial estates had similarly maintained the royal cults within the Memphis temples. The provincial shrines and temples established in the times of the kings of Abusir and Saqqara, however, were of a different order dedicated both to the royal cult and to some of the state gods, these shrines and temples were elaborately sustained in situ by royal decree, so that the full operation of the royal cult was continuously observed in shrines and temples throughout the kingdom. Many of these new provincial foundations were built at the sites of archaic and pre-pharaonic shrines. At Coptis, for example, where several Royal decrees had been preserved in stone inscriptions. There was a very ancient shrine of the god Men. In similar fashion, various excavations that have been undertaken at sites as far apart as the islands of the first cataract in the northern delta have revealed how other archaic sanctuaries that had previously accommodated but a few ceramic offering tables, flint knives and some small images of animals and Humans had been rebuilt and enlarged so that they came to house some of the grand high shining products of Memphis courtly culture. Sophisticated pieces of ritual paraphernalia embellished with royal names, wands, scepters and fine vases of translucent alabasters, royal statues made from hard stone, and objects, on occasion, that recorded the celebration of individual royal festivals. Measuring on average some 15 by 18 yards and enclosed by straight thick rectangular walls made of well-laid mud bricks, the interiors of these newly founded shrines echoed the forms of the central areas of the pyramid temples at Abu Sir and Saqqara and were divided into a series of narrow oblong chambers. In comparison with the skimpy, 
informality of the older shrines, these buildings and their impressive contents speak of the opulence of central government and the imposed regularity of state control. In all probability, the number of these new shrines was greater than their surviving remains suggest. Evidence is sparse, partly because many of these structures were elaborated and overbuilt during the following millennia so that today their locations are marked by some of the most celebrated of the Egyptian temples, whose inscriptions occasionally describe their humble origins in a near-mythic pre-pharaonic past. Hierakonpolis, on the other hand, one of the earliest centers of settlement in the lower Nile Valley was not greatly favored by the Builders of the later kings, and the considerable clutter of archaic objects that had accumulated in its clustered shrines, fine objects such as Narmer's celebrated palette, had been carefully reburied when the later Old Kingdom monarchs had built and furnished a provincial shrine within the prehistoric compound, thus preserving a unique treasury of archaic artifacts which was recovered in the late 1890s. The Archaeologists also revealed the ruin of a fine four-square provincial shrine of the later Old Kingdom and at its center they found a life-sized golden hawk's head which had once topped a wooden cult image, set in its original position within a narrow mud brick sanctum, the carnelian of the bird's darkly shining eyes gives the golden bird an unearthly spark of life. Close by the shrine the excavators found two exquisite life-sized Statues made from sheets of beaten copper, one named in its inscription as King Pepe I, the other nameless, though identifiable by its iconography as a royal child. Those regal images must have been the focus of regular rituals in much the same way as were their counterparts within the Memphite temples, or indeed the figure of the living king. Within the confines of his palace, the oldest known life-size metal statues in the world, the two sculptures are now ranked as masterpieces of pharaonic art, and they yet hold something of the living presence of the pharaohs of that age. Just as their early excavators had seen, such splendid objects shine out from the dust of ruined mud brick buildings. In consequence, during the following decades, dealers dug out many more such treasures and illicit excavations undertaken at several remote locations, which were then sold into the international antiquities market, so the original fine spots of many of those remarkable objects are now lost along with any understanding of their ancient context and, thus, their roles within the daily rituals of the royal rites. And that is an especial shame, for similarly splendid objects of the royal cult are hardly ever found within the Memphite temples. Nevertheless, in their new roles as glittering treasures in museum cases, their crisp inscriptions and fine craftsmanship still testify that, in the later Old Kingdom, there was a powerful royal presence throughout the provinces of the ancient kingdom of the Lower Nile, a history of gods just as the statewide diffusion of the royal cult along the Lower Nile could be described as a monumentalization of the pulse of tithing and offering that had sustained the Memphite court from its beginning so. Two, as the mix of kings and gods in the triads of Minkori had shown, the roles of the kings and gods within the royal cult had long been intertwined. From their first appearances, indeed, the familiar gods of ancient Egypt are shown as members of the pharaonic household, and, like the other members of that extended family they were included in, the essential round of tithe offering and sustenance. The origins of these state deities are presently unknown. Certainly, many of their hieroglyphic attributes, the signs and iconographies by which they are identified, were created in prehistoric times, yet that fact alone does not prove that those same gods were already in existence in those distant ages. As with many other faiths, those ancient icons could well have been awarded to new-made gods as suitable attributes of deity. The hawk, for example, is a truly archaic sign of royalty, as many images testify. The name of the first pharaoh, indeed, was set inside an image of the royal residence beneath the same archaic image of a hawk. Whilst a later variant of the royal name, 
invented in the time of the colossal pyramids, the so-called name of gold, was similarly set beneath that sign. The god Horus, on the other hand, whose name is also determined in formal hieroglyphs by the image of a hawk, is presently recorded as making his debut as a god in the reign of Huni, Sneferu's predecessor, when a court craftsman drew a hawk's head upon the body of a man, a process that was cleverly reversed in the following century, when court sculptors set a human head upon an animal's body and made the sphinx. In his first known appearance in human form, Horus is identified in the accompanying inscription as Horus of the royal residence, thus underlining his close relationship to Pharaoh and his house, and that new made deities stand shoulder to shoulder with King Huni, their eyes. The humans and the raptors, caught in common if unearthly gaze whilst Horus' hands and arms wrap tenderly around the royal torso, just as the sculpted hawk's wings embrace the back of Koffer's head in that most celebrated statue. Whenever the state gods were first conceived, they were without exception brought into sharp focus and given human form within the Memphite workshops. Along with the rest of pharaonic culture, the offering tables, the nobles' tomb chapels, the pyramids, the regalia and Throne of Pharaoh, the architectures that contain the offices of royal ritual, those anthropomorphic deities were literally the products of the studios of Memphi craftsmen. Certainly, there is no evidence of the existence in those times of an abstract theology, of a science of things. Divine, as Dean Hooker has described it, which had prompted their creation. Nothing but those elegant synthetic images. Nor, indeed is there evidence to suggest that those new May deities had been worshipped in old kingdom times by the various populations of the lower nile one of the peculiarly modern difficulties in appreciating the nature of such ancient gods is the common tendency to assume that they had similar literary personalities to those that we associate with gods today that they were like the frisky deities on winkelman's mount olympus or that they have been elements of one of those so-called primitive religions catalogued by Victorian anthropologists. Yet the pharaonic deities cannot be explained by labeling them as figures in a myth or gods of this or that, or as symbols of life or death, the rising wheat, the sun, the moon, and though later in pharaonic history many of them came to embody complex contradictions of living human beings, and thus appear as personalities, they were neither sub-Freudian personifications of aspects of human consciousness nor elements in a kind of anthropomorphic science that had been invented to explain the order of the universe. In short, these early courtly deities do not appear to have been parts of a coherent religion such as Champollion or the modern world would recognize not Western gods at all. All that the surviving relics show is that the rites that were conducted in their shrines and temples were modeled on those that ordered the life of Pharaoh and the royal household and the ritual within the royal mortuary temples, that they, too, were sustained by the day-to-day -day processes of provisioning and offering. Later texts, therefore, describe these gods in the present tense. Just as they describe the courtly dead as living in the living world, they rise up with the sun today, they move now upon the wind, with the swaying of the palms and sycamores, with the rhythms of sun and moon and stars, with the round of the royal festivals and the daily cult. Unlike the earthly members of the court, however, if these unseen members of the royal household were granted offerings they too would live throughout the generations along with the populations of the dead and the offices of state, seen and unseen. That two complementary worlds, seen and unseen, existed side by side. In Pharaoh's kingdom was a prehistoric inheritance. The excavated graves of those distant periods confirmed that the early farming communities along the lower Nile had similarly assumed that not all of the person had died when life was seen to have left their bodies, that although those intangible, unseen aspects of living beings had separated, from the physical body at the time of death their vitality had not left the 
living world and could yet form a vital and continuing part of community identity. So the living have catered for the survival of those unseen aspects of their group by making elaborate arrangements for individual burials and by nourishing the continuing presence of the dead through acts of offering and feasting at the grave, just as modern. Archaeologists describe and define those early cultures from material, which for the most part has been recovered from their cemeteries, so too. In prehistoric times, without the energies that the early farmers had, continued to lavish on their dead, those living settlements would have lost touch with their ancestors and thus lost the continuity of group. Identity, along with the elaborate rites of burial, such continued acts of Offering were also the defining activities of the pharaonic state and engaged the best part of its resources, prompting the building of its monuments and the maintenance of both the living court and of the noble dead, the past and present state, and the cult of offering, the ceremonial conducted daily in the royal palace, the rituals of royal burial and enthronement, the rites that were performed in a myriad shadowed shrines throughout the regions of the lower Nile continuously maintain those vital links between the mundane and the mysterious between the seen and unseen such activities as pyramid building and temple ritual provide a peculiarly modern difficulty of understanding for they are not readily pigeonholed in such terms as art religion or economics and that in turn affects our understanding of the role of pharaoh in the narratives of pharaonic history if those kings had ruled as many historians have assumed, by divine, right in the manner of early modern European monarchs, or if they are, imagined to have governed in the brutal manner of Old Testament kings, or of Roman emperors, or even as modern dictators, then the ages that followed the building of the four colossal pyramids, the age of the kings, of Abusir and Saqqara, can only be portrayed as a time of crisis and Deterioration, for such a huge decline in pyramid building must have inevitably signaled a weakening of pharaonic power and a rise of superstitious provincialism. What the surviving relics show, alternatively, is that the nature of the state had changed. That is the courtly systems which had overseen the building of the colossal pyramids were elaborated and monumentalized. So too the unseen aspects of that ancient courtly world were similarly systemized, and gods like Horus, Hathor, and Re, who previously had been but vague presences, were brought into clear view whilst others, like the god Osiris, made their first appearance. At the temples of Abusir, the kings were shown suckling at the breast of huge lion-headed goddesses, carved in beautiful low relief on the massive stone posts of the temple's entrance doors, those images were given a majestic intimacy by the core craftsmen, with the added free song, of placing the king's head close to that of a cold and passive feline, like the Hathor figures in the statue groups of Menkore, such powerful images set Pharaoh clearly within a group of deities. In similar fashion, the texts in Tinus tomb chapels describe the provincial nobles both as estate administrators and as priests of a now-vanished temple named as the House of Hathor-Hathor a mother, goddess who was so close to the living king that her very name means House of Horus. Other texts within those chapels record that a royal nation of some forty acres had been specifically provided to support the activities of Hathor's cult down through the generations. Here too, as in the Memphi temples, offerings would have been made in the royal name and priests would have dressed the figure of the goddess every day and made offerings to her in the same manner in which the rituals of the royal cult were celebrated. In modern terms, translated epithets in those tomb chapels designate those courtiers as overseers of priests and as provincial lords, apparently distinguishing their civil and religious roles. In reality, of course, there were aspects of a single social order. To that extent, the Gods of ancient Egypt were more practical and less given to easy explanation than Champollion and many of his successors have. Imagine, Pharaoh had sat the center of an intricate net of rituals and relationships that had encompassed every aspect of courtly life and 
death within the region of the lower Nile, and that it was which gave the role of Pharaoh a numinosity that, in some small part, surrounds the offices of heads of state down to this day.